Joining us now is Democratic Congresswoman from New York, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, thank you so much for being here on, well, a day that will go down in the history books. Thank you for having me. Let's just start with what it was like to bear witness to this Republican fracture firsthand on the floor of Congress. How, how did you leave the chamber today? You know, I was... Um I was honestly surprised. I did not think that Kevin McCarthy was going to have the votes in the first round, but I didn't think that it was going to be as catastrophic for him as it actually was. I think one of the things that we saw was, you know, we saw that there were reports of there being up to 20 holdouts on the Republican side, except Usually in the 24 to 48 hours before a vote, there are a lot of negotiations that happen, and Kevin McCarthy was engaging in some of those negotiations in order to bring that number down. Now, I didn't think he was going to have the vote at all, but uh, we at least thought that that number would be less. But to get into the high teens in, you know, nearly 18, 19 members uh, refusing to support his speakership is an astonishingly high number. And I think it very much speaks to the lack of faith uh, among elected Republicans that they have in Kevin McCarthy's speakership. And for him to have several months since the November elections and still not be able to clinch it, I think is very much a testament to a lack of leadership. Um, and it is very surprising to see that. Uh, but, uh, you know, in the contrast on the Democratic side, we didn't have a single defection. And that unity is very much going to help us um, in, you know, hopefully being able to uh, secure some uh, procedural wins and take advantage of certain moments. And I definitely want to return to that topic in terms of the democratic unity and the conversations that have been happening, happening inside the caucus. But it did not, uh, it did not go unnoticed, by, shall we say, on the internet and elsewhere, that you were on the floor having some conversations with Republicans, including Matt Gates and Paul Gosar. Can you enlighten us at all as to, as to what those conversations were like? And is there any hope that you guys work together to get Hakeem Jeffries elected as Speaker of the House? You know, I um, I think in, in chaos, anything is possible, uh, especially in this era. You know, uh, it is unlikely, but it is there's always a possibility. I do think that in terms of some of those conversations, I mean, listen, some of us in the House of Representatives uh, are independent in certain ways from our party. And I do believe that uh, in some of those conversations, um, there are things that are happening on the floor. These machinations are happening on the floor. And sometimes the leadership of your party, uh, in this case, the Republican Party, will be making claims uh, in order to try to twist arms and get people in line. And a lot of times, information and truth is currency. Um, so sometimes to be able to fact check some of the claims that McCarthy is making, uh, whether Democrats are going to defect or not, et cetera, is important in order to keep him honest and to keep people honest in general. And so, you know, I think what was important today was to send the message that we were united uh, behind uh, Hakeem Jeffries as um, the now minority leader uh, or as leader of the Democrats and that there would be no defections, that Democrats are here, uh, we're not going anywhere. And if they want to play ball, we're open to that. That's that's going to make a lot of people, I think, on one side of the aisle very happy and a lot of people on the other side of the aisle very concerned. Is it your sense that there is a plan that the Freedom Caucus has? I mean, there's a real question about who's driving, the, who's, who's running the operation here, who's driving the bus. Is it Kevin McCarthy or is it, you know, Andy Biggs and Paul Gosar and Matt Gates? Well, I think one of the central challenges here is that in this in Kevin McCarthy's speaker run within the Republican caucus, there was no number two. Uh, the Republican caucus did not really have a full-throated race for speaker. There was no challenger uh, in the last two months that has emerged, and I do believe that that is the central Republican problem. Uh, whether McCarthy pulls this through or not, the core concern here is who would ascend to that seat. I do not believe that Kevin McCarthy has the votes. I believe that uh, a lot of the opposition to him is very personal. I believe his leadership style uh, is incompatible with a lot of Republican members and certainly the Democratic caucus. And so I think that is the central question. If not him, 
than who. Uh, you have certain members of the Freedom Caucus who have, of course, uh, nominated other people, but the rest of the Republican Party will not rally, I believe. They will not coalesce under Jim Jordan. Jim Jordan himself doesn't want it. They will not coalesce uh, under someone uh, like Andy Biggs. And so the question is, is there anyone in their caucus that can build that consensus? If there isn't, uh, McCarthy's team may have to come to the Democratic Party. And if that's the case, then what would that even look like? It's rather unprecedented. Could it result in a potential coalition government? Could we get Democratic chairs of committees uh, as a result? We don't know. Uh, but ultimately, it, what we saw here today is that in the last two months, and now, Kevin McCarthy failed to unite his caucus and failed to even, you know, I think he failed to respect the power of the Freedom Caucus uh, enough as well. They are members of his party in order to build that coalition together. He failed as a coalition builder not once, not twice, but three times. And we reconvene tomorrow morning. And I'm not quite sure what he could or would do that would change the calculus between today and tomorrow. And that's a huge question. We know that, that approximately 7,000 boxes of pizza were delivered to uh, McCarthy's office, which suggests it's going to be a long night of negotiating. You suggested that Democrats are open to any overtures from McCarthy's office. Have there been any? Can you Are you at liberty to say whether there are even preempt, you know, preemptive conversations going on? Yeah, I think... Open <laughs> is a generous term. I'm not saying necessarily that uh, our party is signaling in, in openness just yet, but really it's about the cards that are in McCarthy's hands. And if he chooses to approach uh, the Democratic caucus, then that would be a negotiation in and of itself for a potential coalition government. Uh, but again, this is very much an unprecedented time. In your opening, you discussed what happened in 1855. The last time this happened was in 1923. And so we really have not seen many times in American history. And it is not a coincidence that they are times of division, times of extraordinary strife, disenfranchisement, and inequality. And I think that these are things that the Republican caucus is very much contending with. I also want to note that some of the requests made by these, uh, made by these Republican holdouts are also small d democratic in nature in terms of the rules of the House. You know, over a very long period of time, the concentration of power in the House of Representatives has has concentrated to an extraordinary amount in party leadership of both parties. And what we see from the House Freedom Caucus is their attempt, however guided, misguided, destructive, constructive, whatever your perspective is, they are making attempts to reform the rules of the House in a way that would dilute McCarthy or the speaker's power and elevate the power of every of, of individual members in the House. And that, I think, is a, an essential crux that is part of, of the rub here in their inability to create an agreement. So, you know, if McCarthy really wants this, he really needs to look at how he can get to the 218 that he needs. And you got to find that math somewhere. If you can't get that vo those votes from the House Freedom Caucus, and he has provided many, many, many concessions, um, and it's just not working out. I, I, I got to ask you, um, you know, getting concessions from leadership can be done in many ways. And the House Republican Freedom Caucus has chosen a pretty public and fractious way to gain concessions. What happened on the Democratic side of the aisle in terms of this unbelievable unity in a very big tent party? I mean, what was the conversation like between parts of the Democratic Party that are much further left, much more progressive than some of the more centrist leadership, and in particular, Hakeem Jeffries, the, the, the new leader? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I think there are a couple of things that are that are happening right now. One is that in order for us to take advantage of the fracturing on the Republican side, we have to operate as a full entire block. This margin is extraordinarily slim. We're talking about a margin of four votes. And so if they get to a point where they lose four or five votes and we stay 100 percent united, then there are possibilities where 
If it's not this vote, it could be other votes. There are procedural moments in the House where you can prevent, in their case, catastrophic legislation from coming to the floor if we remain united. I think some of these conversations coming forward is an acknowledgement of the severity of this point in history. Uh, we are talking about a very real danger in a Republican-controlled House. And that could mean that a very narrow, slim margin of four to five votes could have implications on whether we can raise a debt ceiling. It could have implications even on the 2024 election. And in, you know, January 6th was all about the refusal to certify every state's election results. And it is no secret that Republicans have indicated that there are several who are willing to do it again. They are willing to reject certification of a presidential election if they do not like the results. And I believe that on the Democratic side, the acknowledgement of how fragile our democracy is in this moment is a critical part to that unity. We absolutely have differences. Um, but I think a willingness to put that aside in order to figure out how we can navigate and exploit some of these major moments to advance really the issues of working people, raise wages, protect health care, and really defend a lot of the gains that we have made in the last two to three years is going to be very critical. Yeah, it's it's so important to underscore the fact that the last time this happened beyond 1923 was the eve of the Civil War, and it really does feel like an inflection point in terms of major, major social issues, race, identity, the whole lot. Um, no one knows what's going to happen. We are so deeply grateful for your time, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, of course, from the great state of New York. Thank you for your time tonight. We really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you very much.